And we will read verses 14 through 30, where we talk about the parable, the talents. And as you know, he's not referring here to talents like, I can uh, play the piano, that's a talent. Really, I can't. But he's talking about money, it's called talents. Also uh, in another passage called minus. So we're gonna talk about here the parable of the talents. A talent was a monetary unit worth about 20 years wages. Well, that's a chunk of change, a lot of money. Matthew 25, verse 14, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has will, be, will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then also to the Belgic Confession, you can turn in your forms booklets to page 198. <clears throat> so just for the sake of time, I'm jumping down to the very bottom of page 198. We've read here about Christ's return, about the judgment, about the resurrection at the end times. Then the books, that is, the consciences will be opened and the dead will be judged according to the things they did in the world, whether good or evil. Indeed, all people will give account of, the, of all the idle words they have spoken, which the world regards as only playing games. And then the secrets and hypocrisies of men will be publicly uncovered in the sight of all. Therefore, with good reason, the thought of this judgment is horrible and dreadful to wicked and evil people but it is very pleasant and a great comfort to the righteous and elect, since their total redemption will then be accomplished. They will then receive the fruits of their labor and of the trouble they have suffered. Their innocence will be openly recognized by all, and they will see the terrible vengeance that God will bring on the evil ones who tyrannized, oppressed, and tormented them in this world. The evil ones will be convicted by the witness of their own consciences and shall be made immortal but only to be tormented in the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In contrast, the faithful and elect will be crowned with glory and honor. The Son of God will confess their names before God his Father and the holy and elect angels. All tears will be wiped from their eyes and their cause, at present condemned as heretical and evil by many judges and civil officers, will be acknowledged as the cause of the Son of God. And as a gracious reward, the Lord will make them possess a glory such as the heart of man could never imagine. So we look forward to that great day with longing in order to fully enjoy the promises of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the Belgic Confession talks about a reward, and as a gracious reward, the Lord will make them possess a glory. And then also further on page 199, then they will receive the fruits of their labor and of the trouble they have suffered. So you'll find here 
If you turn in your bulletins, <coughs> there are some places that you can f fill in some blanks. Here's where we've been. The purpose of the final judgment, a public demonstration of God's justice, a public vindication of God's Son, Gospel, and Church. The final judgment is according to man's works. We've uh, meditated on that. And then we've been looking at the sentence rendered at the final judgment. We've looked at the sentence upon the wicked. <clears throat> and where we are at this morning is the sentence for the righteous. <clears throat> what we have seen with the sentence rendered at the final judgment for the righteous is the following. That there will be a real, actual judgment of believers at the final judgment. Um, this is not because their salvation is called into doubt. It is not because uh, this is a justification, another justification, that they need a second one of the sort. No, the moment we believe in Jesus, we're justified, we're declared innocent, we're declared righteous. But there is a judgment of the righteous before Christ the King, as we already said, to publicly demonstrate his justice and to publicly vindicate not only his gospel and his son, but to vindicate us as well, so that the world can see that we believed in Christ and were the children of God. Uh, but for example, Hebrews 10, the Lord will judge his people, 1 Peter 4, for it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. James chapter 3, verse 1, teachers will receive, will be judged with greater strictness. So I and other teachers will be judged more strictly on the last day than you will. Paul says for that, James says for that reason that not many people should seek to be teachers. It will be a real judgment. Nevertheless, as we're looking now, it's not a judgment that we fear. Why? Because we're in Christ. In fact, the neat thing about John chapter 3, verse 15, with the um, serpent being lifted up, uh, I'll just point this out to you for one second. The preposition uh, in him, it says here, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In the Greek, it's actually this. And whoever believes may have eternal life in him. Believes is, said, is, a, is an absolute statement. Jesus says to Nicodemus, whoever believes what? Believes this testimony that I've been giving has eternal life in me, in him. So um, we approach the final judgment with great joy and with great comfort. The fact that Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Lord and our Savior will be our judge, the one who has saved us, will be our judge, gives us great comfort. And uh, the one who has loved us and washed us with his blood will be the same who will judge our hearts. He is not a hard master. He is indeed a loving master. The reason why in this parable the man thought him to be a hard master is because his own heart was hard. You know, we often do that, don't we? We impute upon other people our own sins. And you see that it's a psychological thing. I learned this in psychology in college, but it's a, it's a fact. And so this guy thought God was hard. Why? Because his heart was hard. According to the Belgian Confession, the thought of this judgment is very pleasant and a great comfort to the righteous and the elect, since their total redemption will then be accomplished. So there's a couple blanks you can just fill in there. Um, they will be vindicated and welcomed into his kingdom. The thought of this judgment is very pleasant and a great comfort to the righteous and the elect. And um, we're not going to, we've got to move ahead, but there's some, we can come back to this if we need to. Listen to some scriptures. He will be glorified in his saints when he returns, marveled at among all who have believed. So you see there in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 that there's no fear. That when Jesus descends and we're instantly transformed in new bodies with new souls, he will be glorified among us. And it says in 1 John that the righteous will have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. He will say, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So we look forward to this full review by our Savior, who will examine our works, our words, our deeds, what we have suffered. We don't approach that with fear and trepidation, 
but we approach it as a child who brings their assignment to their school teacher and they're beaming from ear to ear and see what I have done. And the teacher praises them. So uh, there will be uh, a final judgment. We will be vindicated, welcomed into his kingdom. It's a great comfort. But we look at the third bullet point where we want to spend some time this morning is the righteous are going to be rewarded for their deeds. And this is something that sometimes we struggle with. The Belgic Confession says that at the final judgment, the righteous and the elect will then receive the fruits of their labor and of the trouble they have suffered. The uh, Huddleberg also talks about this reward. We'll look at that in a little minute. But listen to the final beatitude. The final beatitude describe the beatitudes describe what a Christian is: poor in spirit, meek, humble, pure in heart, etc., peacemakers. But the final description of a of a Christian is he suffers for the sake of Jesus. And that final beatitude comes with not only a blessing but the promise of a reward. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Final week of his life, Jesus gives three parables. I don't know if it's the final week, the parable of the great banquet. It probably was. Three parables to speak about the reward that will be given to the righteous at the final judgment. The parable of the great banquet the parable of the talents, and the parable of the ten minas. We read uh, the parable of the talents. In this parable, one servant is given five talents, another is given two, and another is given one. The five makes five more, the two makes two more, and the one hides it in the ground. When the first two come to Jesus, they have produced 100% profit. They have doubled what had been given them. And the master says to them, well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. So there's a reward, there's a, a benefit, a recompense. Enjoy, enter into the joy of your master. In a very similar parable, the parable of the 10 minus in Luke 19, the same scenario occurs. In this case, 10 servants are each given one mina. I think that's about a three months wage. And, and they are told to do the same thing. One servant who has one mina makes 10 more. One who has one mina makes five more. And then the other one squanders his mina. And, and the same thing repeats itself, that the one who gets, makes 10 minas is given 10 cities to oversee. The one who has made five minas off of his one is given five cities to oversee. The point of this parable is that there is a reward for the labors of these servants. In fact, the one who had made 10 more is given the one mina from the servant who refused to invest it, so now he has 11. And so we see here in this parable as well that there is a recompense at the end. Similarly, the parable of the great banquet, Luke 14. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So Jesus says, don't invite others that can repay you back because I'm going to repay you back. I'm going to repay you back at the final resurrection. So we have three parables that teach a reward is given to the righteous. Paul discusses this in 1 Corinthians 3 with respect to those who labor in the ministry of the word. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive wages, his wages according to his labor. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. The point in 1 Corinthians 3, and you'll remember that building with wood, stray, wood, wood, straw, and hay, and those who build with the precious metals. And Paul is saying there that at that final judgment, the labors of ministers will come to their full review. 
uh, their salvation's not in jeopardy. They're born again believers. But if they have labored uh, foolishly with inadequate materials, their labors will be sort of wiped away. They will still be saved, but they will get no recompense, no reward. So in this case, in 1 Corinthians 3, each minister is rewarded according to the quality of his labors. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. We typically will look at that text and think that he's speaking about this world, that if you do something good, you'll get something good back, etc., or vice versa, you do something bad. But the language of sowing and reaping is so frequently in Scripture a reference to the final harvest, to the end. Those who sow much will receive a greater reward at the end than those who sow sparingly. That's a principle that the Lord will see um, fulfilled at the end of time. The metaphor of harvest, of sowing and harvest, is a metaphor that's taken up so often with reference to the final judgment. So Christ is saying here, or Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians 9, that sowing sparingly and reaping sparingly, or sowing uh, bountifully and reaping bountifully, has to do with that reward that we will get at the final judgment, either large or small. A couple other texts, you write these proof texts down, Ephesians 6, 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. Hebrews 6, 10, for God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Hebrews eleven six. and without faith, it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Revelation twenty two twelve. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone according to what he has done. A recompense for the righteous. Promise after promise, assurance after assurance, proof text after proof text, that there is a reward, a recompense, a repayment for the righteous for what they have done and what they have suffered for the sake of Christ. There, they will be rewarded for their deeds. Fourth bullet point. These rewards are gifts of his grace. Underscore that. We can say without a doubt that any reward that is given is totally undeserved. That we do not have a quid pro quo relationship with God that I scratch his back, he scratches my back. No, he saved my soul from damnation. He gave me the Holy Spirit in regeneration. All that I do is a product of the work of the Holy Spirit within me. So any reward that God chooses to give is not a debt he owes. We are debtors to his grace. Um, you can look real quickly here at the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 24. I'll get you a, a page number one second. Lord's Day 24, question 63. Page 226, 226, at the very top. How can our good works be said to merit nothing when God promises to reward them in this life and the next? The answer is this reward is not merited. It is a gift of grace. And you see proof text, so you can look at that on your own, but you can see that Heidelberg Catechism as well says that there is a reward given, but it's not one that we have deserved or earned. It is out of his grace. I think of what Jesus says in John 15. He is the branch, or he is the vine, we are the branches. What does he say? Apart from me, you can do nada, nothing. So any gift that God gives, any reward is a benefit, is a blessing, is out of his grace. I'm not going to have time here, but we could look at the Roman Catholic position. They believe actually in congruent merit and condign merit. They believe that uh, the reward is actually things that you have earned, you've deserved it, God's paying you back, like you get paid hourly wage. Um, so we do not believe that. All reward is of his grace. Fifth bullet point, these rewards will vary in degree and in kind. 
Many scriptures will indicate that the reward is not dispensed in equal measure between the saints. Every reward is a gift of God's grace, but that does not mean that every reward is equally distributed. Some have served much and suffered more than others. Others have suffered and served less. And the rewards are going to be according to what they have done and what they have borne for him. Each will receive a reward in keeping with the service rendered. Let me give you some examples. Jesus says in Matthew 8, I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The point is, is that there is a preference and proximity in the kingdom of heaven to Christ. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and others sitting next to them. A proximity and a preference. But that doesn't exclude other believers. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious thrones, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. A proximity and a preference given to the twelve apostles who are given twelve thrones to sit upon. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, as we already had looked at, that a minister's labors will be tested through fire, whether they have built with combustible materials or imperishable materials. So the judgment will be, um, will be, our work will be tested in its value and its quality and will be rewarded accordingly. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says that his labors will be rewarded according to the quality of his labor. Furthermore, the poor man is carried to Abraham's side, Luke 16. Think about this, at the transfiguration, who appears with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. Why not Samuel and Enoch? Why those two? Why did they get to go? Why didn't the others get to go? You see that there is a carryover from the works done in this life to the privileges carried over into the next life. That Moses and Elijah, who figured prominently in the Old Covenant, have privileges that are carried over into the New Covenant. And so we have here um, the symbolic description of the heavenly Jerusalem. Here's another one. The symbolic description of the heavenly Jerusalem has the names of the 12 apostles. It doesn't have my name on that foundation. It is Peter, James, John, Andrew, Nathaniel. These passages suggest that the peculiar distinctions and prerogatives that the Lord has granted to his servants in this life are not lost upon the life to come. The role played by the patriarchs, prophets, and the apostles in the course of redemptive history is remembered perpetually. The richness, diversity, and degree of privilege and responsibility in this life seem to find their correspondence and fulfillment in the life to come. Think of 1 Peter 5, 4. There is a crown of glory, which is a special reward given for the faithful ministry of those who serve as shepherds of the flock of God. Um, so there is a reward that differs, as we see here, that vary in degree and in kind. Now, let's be clear. So we're not going to get this all done, which is okay. This does not mean that some believers just get the crumbs like the Syrophoenician women that fall from the master's table and everybody else gets a whole loaf of bread. It doesn't mean that some just get the scraps. Uh, heaven will be heaven because Christ is there. And Satan is not, and sin is not, and, si and suffering is not. Here's an analogy. Think of two buckets. You've got a big five-gallon bucket, and you got a little tiny bucket, a bucket from the, you know, make sandcastles with, a little toy bucket. Both buckets are dipped into the water, dipped into the ocean. Both are full and overflowing. Both are submerged in water. There's no lack in either one. One just has a greater capacity than the other. But both are completely satisfied. So do not think that these varying degrees and rewards of privileges and whatnot means that some will have less, that there will be some lack, that some will have some kind of deficiency. 
If you have a trouble with this, think of it like the way it is already now. We see in the kingdom of God today a diversity of gifts, giftedness, office, of capacity for service, for suffering. Of um, We see all of that diversity of 1 Corinthians 12 of the body of Christ that doesn't breed contention but actually produces gratitude and humility. It's just going to be that way in the new world. Uh, the church is the body of Christ, and there will be different roles, responsibilities, and privileges. Um, what we see then will be what we see already now in heaven with the diversity and harmony that exists between angels, cherubim, and seraphim. Does a seraphim ever say, I wish I was a cherubim? Why does he get to be so close to the cherubim, to the throne? Because the cherubim are the closest. And then you have the seraphim. And the angels are over here, and they're the ones coming and going and ministering to us. Is there contention or disunity? It's beautiful harmony. Different privileges, different roles, different gifts, giftedness, responsibilities. And none are hankering after the others, but all are mutually grateful for God's wise distribution of his gifts. Rather than making the believer envious, which could not happen anyways, the gracious distribution of God's rewards will only be further cause for us to praise God for his infinite wisdom and his wise bestowment of the rewards. And um, kids are up, so we're going to have to end with that. But what we're going to see here as we wrap it up next week, that um, the rewards are not known in their specificity. We're going to look at what can we say about them, what don't we know about them. They are not known in their specificity. And then um, also to answer some questions, you might think, well, what reward am I going to get? Oh, what have I done? I've done nothing. Well, we're going to look at that, and then we're going to look at why does God give rewards? What has provoked him to do this? Obviously, it's of grace, but, but why? And that will be, I think, a very encouraging lesson for us all. Let's sing.